Now, when I'm reading all this in this book, it seems very fantastical. It seems dubious at best. I didn't think the book was particularly well written. I was very skeptical about it. So there I am sitting in the Denny's. I've got the Montauk Project book and I'm holding it up. And this guy walks by and he literally looks like he's going to ride a Harley Davidson. Okay, not at all somebody you think would have been in the military. He's got the big salt and pepper beard. He's got the hair. He's got the denim jacket. And he's got the denim pants. And he's got cowboy boots. And he's a big, heavy guy. And so it's a little intimidating just to have this kind of a Harley rider walk up to you at all in a restaurant. You're, it's nighttime. I'm by myself. And what's going on? So what do you think of that Montauk stuff? And I said, oh, man, you know, this book is bullshit. And he said, well, I used to work for Preston Nichols. Preston Nichols is the author of the book, the guy that ran the Montauk Project. And I, I actually, I mean, despite the fact that he was a Harley rider or looked like he was, uh, you know, he had some metal studs on his clothing and things like this, I, I just kind of heckled him. And I said, oh, come on, man, you know, you can't expect me to believe that you worked for Preston Nichols and you were involved in all the stuff that was in this book. He said, well, if you want to listen to me, I will tell you what I know and you decide if it's true. So I said, okay, well, you know, sit down, let's, let's talk about this. So I ended up being in that restaurant for hours and I had taken placemats from the other tables and flipped them over because there's white on the back and I'm writing all this stuff down and I'm and he's drawing pictures it was amazing and I proceeded to end up having years of contact with this guy um, and he wanted to go by the name Daniel and he told me an incredible amount of stuff he was a genius kid who in the 1970s had built a computer with an operating system which was not at all normal. And because of that, in being in the science fair, they have these government people who go to recruit, right? So they find this kid at the science fair, and they say, well, how would you like to have a job for the government? How would you like to work in some very, very interesting stuff that nobody else gets to know about? That's how he got brought in. So what he told me was that the company he worked for was called Brookhaven, Brookhaven National Labs, and that this was this this defense contractor actually owned this derelict, supposedly derelict military base at Montauk Point, Long Island. He claims that he was involved in engineering the time portal technology that was being used with this seat, and specifically there were all these various wavelengths that came out of the chair. And he said that the wavelengths would represent the consciousness of the, of the person inside the chair. What they were trying to get him to do for his job was to look at these wavelengths and figure out how to build a digital or analog computer that could generate those waves because they wanted to be able to run this without a human being. They couldn't get the time portal technology to work unless somebody who was a trained person was in the chair. And he said that he couldn't use digital because ultimately digital goes in stair steps like this. But that the final conclusion was with an analog computer, you can get the same nice waves that they got. And it seems like they got pretty close. The whole project, he was involved in it from about February 1981 to August 1983. And so in the Montauk story, what we hear about is that this strange monstrosity was generated and it trashes the base. He didn't go to work that day. And so then they called him and told him, don't come back. The job has been canceled. So he was very, very fortunate not to be there on the day that everything got destroyed and that they didn't mind wipe him either. So he was left with his memories. And he had stayed in contact with a group of insiders that he had met on the job and I got a lot of information from him, not only from his own personal experience, but from the other insiders that he knew. So at this time, all the way back in the, the main period where I got the information from him was 2003 through 2005. 
he told me that what we see in the Stargate SG-1 television series and the movie is totally accurate, that that was based on truth. So apparently our government had located in Egypt some kind of ring-shaped object buried in the sand that actually will allow people to go through it and travel from planet to planet. And he talked to me about how every planet has its own Stargate address. And for many, many years, I didn't give out the Stargate address because I wanted to try to sort out the wheat from the chaff. But what he told me was that it was a long number, and each one of the numbers has to do with a division of some part of our universe. So the first three numbers are 7, 5, and 3 of our address. Then the next numbers are 84, 70, 24. And that's now you're getting into quadrants that are divided up into units of 100. So we're 84, 70, 24. Then the final digit is 606. And so Earth is 606. Mars is 605, and literally, if you go up to this gate, you can dial in any numerical code you want, and it will take you to that planet. And what he explained was, he had been told that elder extraterrestrials, very ancient ETs, had designed this and upheld it. And when a planet no longer had human life on it, they would recycle the number and use it for another planet. Another interesting thing that he told me was that there is a planet at the gate address of 001. And he said that that planet was orbiting a pulsar, a very strange type of star that pulsates. And as a result, they were able to live there a really long time. And he said those people were called the Aesir, A-E-S-I-R, or Asgard. And that those are the people who were visiting the Vikings and gave rise to the whole legend of Valhalla, that kind of stuff, that Valhalla was actually going through the Stargate and going back to their planet with the gate address of 001. So bear in mind that between 2003 and 2005, I had extensive contact with this man, and I became utterly convinced that there are traversable wormholes, that we can travel faster than light, that we do have interactions with various extraterrestrial species. He did talk about that there were certain extraterrestrial groups that showed up on the base. Later on, he went through hypnotic regression with Dr. Leo Sprinkle, and under hypnosis, he started to remember a lot more, and that included that he was working with reptilian beings and that they were actually teaching them at that base how to get the chair working, how to get the right power supply, training the psychics on how to tune properly for the chair, it was a very intense, complicated story, and you have to understand that for this roughly two and a half year period, I was constantly trying to get him caught in something. I was constantly cross-examining. I would ask funny questions. I would try to see if he could contradict himself. And no matter how much I tried, his testimony was remarkably consistent. It just stayed the same. In 2018, President Trump announced the development of Space Force, the sixth branch of the U.S. military. To establish a Space Force. The president and the American public were completely unaware that it already existed. <laughs> that went all the way out into the galaxy. 